bottle, do you? Can you imagine? Twelve cents a pound for a leg of lamb. Oh, John. Well, it's a little surprise I have for you, Mary. It's a telephone. A telephone? That thing for talking over a wire? Isn't it just a toy? No, indeed. Why, I've been talking from here all the way down to the office downtown. A useful thing like that is more than a toy. Do you want to try it? Well, yes. I don't mind. All right, I'll signal the office. All you have to do is to press this button and then wait until someone answers. Here, you do the talking. What do I say? Oh, say hello when the chief clerk answers and then say, we'll say whatever you please. Hello? 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 Hello, is this the office? I can't hear much of anything. Sounds like someone crying. Oh, but my dear, you mustn't be so critical. Of course it sounds strange at first. The advertisement says it will. Well, I don't think much of it. No one will ever use it. Well, you mark my words, dear. The time will come when we will all use it. Well, we may even talk with distant cities. With distant cities? Oh, John, you're such a dreamer. <laughs> speaking is not simply a matter of stringing wires on poles. It is primarily a problem of transmission. The electric waves which carry the voice along the wires are like other waves. The farther they go, the weaker they become. The loading coil introduced in 1901 helps their energy to be better maintained and so improves the efficiency of the telephone circuit. To understand the term loading as used in telephony, let us consider a string along which waves are traveling. If the free end of the string is snapped up and down rhythmically, the waves along the string become weaker as they travel toward the fixed end. If, however, small weights or loads are placed along the string at regular distances, the cells better. In a somewhat analogous manner, loaded telephone circuits are more efficient than unloaded circuits. Consequently, the electric waves carrying the voice can travel farther. But in 1912, a new instrumentality came to telephone engineers for development that was to revolutionize the art of telephony, the vacuum tube, to make possible calls across the country, calls to distant countries, radio programs from a hundred stations. By 1914, it was in commercial service. Ten years later, more than 10,000 were installed on telephone lines. In another decade, there were 350,000. On a conversation between New York and Los Angeles, for example, some 200 vacuum tubes are involved. The majority of the tubes are used as amplifiers or repeaters. They are installed in repeater stations, of which there are some 475 in the United States today, to amplify the voice currents. So expertly are the repeaters made and installed that a whisper at one end of the circuit can be heard at the other end. There are other functions, too. Some of the tubes are used in carrier systems, where they step up the pitch or frequency of the voice currents so that a circuit may carry several conversations, each at a separate controlled pitch or frequency, and hence without interference. Other tubes at the end of the line, of course, must step down these pitches to the original frequencies. 
The loading coil, as we have seen, reduces the loss of electrical energy in the wires, but some loss still remains. It is the vacuum tube repeater which compensates for the remaining loss and at the same time permits the delicate inflections of the human voice or the wide range of orchestral tone to be carried by wires thousands of miles without loss of character or volume. The modern engineer needs many types of vacuum tubes for many purposes. Some no bigger than your finger, some of enormous power for talking across oceans. The vacuum tube is the magic bottle of telephony. It is the Aladdin's lamp that brought into being far speaking. Get your promise, Mary. If I win, I'm to be boss tomorrow. All right, John. <laughs> I'll keep my bargain. <laughs> now, who could be calling us at this time of night? Well, I don't know. I, I'm not expecting any calls. This is Mr. Reynolds' residence. Yes. Yes, he's here. Japan. Oh, just a minute. Mr. Randall, called from Japan. <laughs> Marjorie. Marjorie. <laughs> oh, Come on, Mother. Grace. Come on. Hello. Yes, this is Mr. Reynolds. Go ahead, put them on. Oh, I wish they'd hurry. Hello. Yes. Oh, hello, Marjorie. How are you, honey? It's marvelous to hear your voice. Your voice sounds just the same as ever, Grandpa. Oh, it was lovely of you and Grandma to give us this trip. We were only too glad we could do it, dear. Oh, she's splendid. Wait, here she is. Hello, dear. Oh, bless your heart for calling us. Yes. Yes, we both feel fine. Are you having a good trip? We certainly miss you. All right. You do that. Goodbye, dear. Just imagine. Hearing her voice so clearly. And she's halfway around the world. It's... It's, well, it's impossible. Mm, yet you talked with her and she with you. I know, but Japan, it's uncanny. Mm, but it's true. 
Mother, do you remember what you said of our first telephone in the old house? Do you remember? No, John. What did I say? You said... No one will ever use it. Well, you mark my words, dear. The time will come when we will all use it. Well, we may even talk with distant cities. With distant cities? Oh, John, you're such a dreamer. Why, John, I couldn't have said that. I thought it had a wonderful future. You were the one that didn't believe in it and said that it would never be used. Well, all right, Mother. Let's play another game. Whose deal is it? I thought it had a wonderful future.